All right, so welcome back to this raid speedrun breakdown series that I've started with Last Wish. You guys gave me a lot of positive feedback for that video, so I'm excited to bring you the next chronological raid in Destiny 2's current non-sunset state, and that is of course going to be Garden of Salvation. So Garden of Salvation is one of the fastest raid speedrun completions that is currently on the speedrun.com site, and it's been done in 8 minutes and 38 seconds, so very, very fast. Let's go ahead and take a look at this wonderful raid. Let's start with entrance. So entrance, if you've done garden before, I mean, this is pretty bone standard, nothing too crazy. I mean, they're just gonna be shatter lining to the portal to activate it nice and quick. And uh, you know, the only thing out of the ordinary here that you probably wouldn't see in like an LFG is you got one guy on Gallahorn that's just destroying all of these Minotaurs, chunkier targets from a long distance away. Everyone else is gonna be on Forbearance and Trinity Ghoul to deal with the red bars. Now, the first thing I'm going to point out as soon as we exit this portal here is you may notice that number one, let me get my nifty drawing tool out here, that uh, two people are not, if we look at the radar here, radium's radar, um, two people are not and, you know, they've not gone through the portal. Well, why is that? Well, you'll see in a second. But number two is radium is also throwing this crystal right over here. He's going to jump on it and he's going to jump right over here on this ledge and he's going to use this to shatter skate all the way to the flag nice and fast. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. And you'll see two people have also died in the bottom left corner of my screen. Why is that? Well, these people, this is definitely intentional. What they're doing is something called a death warp. So in Destiny 2, like we've talked about before, uh, activities are generally split into different load zones. So you might have like encounter one and you have a load zone. You might have encounter two and there's like a load zone, right? And there's like some overlapping areas, but basically each different activity in Destiny 2 is generally split up into different load zones like we discussed in the Last Wish speedrun breakdown. And so something cool about load zones, especially those that contain encounters, is that when you start an encounter and there's somebody dead in your load zone, their res actually gets teleported to the starting area of the load zone. So in this case, let's go ahead and see Radium start this encounter. So he's going to start the encounter by shooting the Minotaur, which we'll discuss in a second. But you'll see behind him, his teammates have actually managed to spawn in right behind him. They just need to res after their ghost gets moved. And that's basically how they death warp into first encounter. So you're going to see the death warp technique used actually twice more in this raid. And I'll point it out when it does happen. It'll be like a little callback. But just understand that that is what's going on. That is why uh, those two players died at the back there. You'll also notice that unlike in a normal LFG or a normal garden clear, these guys are starting the encounter by shooting the Minotaur rather than by tethering. Now, I'm sure if you've done a Garden of Salvation LFG or, you know, maybe you've seen some day one clears, people have accidentally killed the Minotaur thinking that it's important because it's an enemy, you should shoot it. But that usually results in chaos because the boss will usually spit the second time faster. And, uh, you know, in the next room, the ads are spawned already. And so it's a bit more hectic. However, in a speed run, this is actually a good thing. And the reason for that is because if you kill this Minotaur quickly, we call it early starting, you kill it before you actually tether, the adds in the next room, which you'll see in just a second here, if I skip a little bit forward, the adds in this next room are already spawned in. I'm sure if you've done Garden before, these Vex up here, for example, they spawn in with this spawning animation and it takes them a bit of time. Now, because these guys early started, right? So they started the encounter nice and early before they even tethered, these ads are already spawned in for them, and that means that they can kill the ads faster, they don't have to wait for them to spawn in, which means they can then spawn in the angelic faster, and of course, as you know, you need to kill the angelic to be able to tether to the door, and obviously that is what gates the progression of the encounter. So that's number one. Number two, the other thing that you might have noticed is that Radium actually, he places a flag as he is shooting the Minotaur. And the reason he does this is because this is a technique in Destiny 2 speedrunning called placing a perma flag or a perma banner or just a perma, whatever you want to call it. Basically what this does is in certain encounters in Destiny 2, whether we're talking dungeons, raids, missions, whatever it is, you can place a flag at a certain time in conjunction with starting the encounter. And if you do so at a certain time, the raid will not erase your flag. The flag will stay there for the rest of the encounter. You can still only rally to it once, but it means that in this case, the teammates that are death warping in from the earlier section can actually um, respawn and they can get a flag. They can get full ammo, full super uh, without having to farm it up by themselves without the flag disappearing. So Radium is essentially doing two things at once. He's killing two birds with one stone. He's starting the encounter early, like I mentioned, to spawn in those ads nice and early to speed up the encounter. But he's also placing a flag that his teammates can now rally to while also starting the encounter as quickly as possible. 
So that's a lot of stuff for just entrance, but let's move on into the bulk of first encounter. There are definitely some really cool strategies here. Garden is a very, very interesting speedrunning raid, has a lot of cool tech. And so we're going to get to see that showcased right now. So another thing that I want to bring up that's not necessarily related to tech, but it's a sort of a speedrunning concept that you'll hear all the time when it comes to Garden of Salvation, specifically this encounter, and that is called a frame roll. So what is a frame roll, you might ask? Well, a frame roll, um, let me just go ahead and write that down on the screen for you. Frame rule, okay? What is a frame roll? Well, a frame roll is basically the game checking for a, you know, a set of objectives to be completed every X number of seconds. This is a speedrunning term. It's present in plenty of games because if the game was checking for something as often as possible at the tick rate or whatever, um, it would be very resource intensive to do so, to run that check very often. So Destiny 2, along with a lot of other games, checks for certain conditions to be met after every, you know, every so, every so often, right? So X seconds. Now in Destiny 2, a lot of activities, they have a one second frame rule for a lot of objectives. So you're not going to notice this, right? If something spawns one second late, a human is generally not going to notice this. The reason why this concept is brought up a lot in Garden specifically is because the game, when it starts checking for angelic spawns, it checks for them every four seconds, okay? And four seconds is a very long time. You may notice in Garden of Salvation, even in an LFG, when you kill all the ads, this angelic may be missing, right? You'll be sitting there and it won't spawn. And that's because you just missed a frame roll, right? So if we just, you know, kind of look at these intervals here, right? If you killed, and let's say the game is checking, you know, at every single one of these green lines, and between every single one of these green lines, there's four seconds, right? If you killed all the ads right here, you would have to wait for this amount of time before the angelic spawned in, right? So frame rules, even though this is not technically something you really play around, because you're still just trying to go as fast as possible, this is just something to be aware of that you may hear when people talk about Garden of Salvation speedrunning. This room in, in particular, four second frame is very long. Uh, frame rules in Destiny are generally nowhere near as long. They're all typically one second and not four seconds. Four seconds. All right, so moving on, I know that was a little bit, you know, complicated, um, but something I wanted to touch because, um, you know, content creators, when they talk about Garden of Salvation speedrunning, they bring it up a lot. So moving on, obviously the Angelics, they are the target of this raid in a lot of encounters. They gate a lot of the progression of the encounters. So being able to kill them very quickly with something like Nighthawk or Izzy with Radiant or Xeno with Radiant or Arbalest is obviously going to be a favorable thing. So let's see here. He's going to Izzy this Cyclops and we're basically through. Now, did you catch something? I'm gonna go back. You may have noticed that these players actually did something very unique. So after tethering, after tethering, after killing the Angelic in what's called the stair room, that first room there, these players, they set up for another tether. Well, what are they doing here? It seems like, oh, they're not killing any of the ads in the tree room. And they're not spawning in the tree Angelic. They're not tethering to a tree room box. What is it that they are doing? Well, this is actually a very cool innovation, a very unique strategy used in Garden of Salvation once again. Like I mentioned, lots of unique speedrun stress in this raid, and this is called room skipping. So what is room skipping? Well, if you didn't know, if you use a stair room tether box to complete the stair room, to tether to the door in the stair room, that box remains usable for the rest of the encounter. It doesn't close up. So what does that mean? It means you can reuse that box to actually unlock future doors. And so when players tried this, they actually realized that future doors, the locks on these doors, are still compatible with the tethers from previous rooms. So that means that if you have a box that's located in a favorable favorable position in the stair room, you can actually use it to solve the tree room's lock. And so unfortunately, this does add some RNG to Garden of Salvation runs because there's only one box out of the three in stair room that's, you know, it's, it's in a good enough position that makes it so that you can six man tether without losing too much time. And that basically makes it so only one out of three runs makes it past first encounter or makes it past even just stair room. However, because of that, you can skip an entire room of ad clear and just move straight to the final room, which is what this team is doing. So by positioning people once again in a nice six man tether, right? Six man tethers, usually LFGs complain when people join the tether unnecessarily. Well, this is one time where the whole team is actually going to be involved in the tether out of necessity. So you get a nice six man tether going and that allows you to actually access this final room without even doing tree room. Okay, so very, very cool strat. More recent strategies versions of this raid speed run uh, are done where they actually skip the, the final room instead of skipping the tree room because it's a little bit more time save. Um, but you know, it's the same concept. You're using the tree room tether box to open up the final room doors. Now, this angelic, obviously they kill it with Radiant Izzy, just like I mentioned, nice and fast. And you might notice here, oh, 
there's only three people in this room. It appears like that there's three radar blips that are going in the opposite direction past the end of the encounter. So if we go ahead and look at Radium here when he comes out of his inventory, you'll see three of his teammates, Miff, G Miners, and Louie, what are they doing over there? Well, they're actually doing something called the 1-2 skip. So why is this 1-2 skip feasible? Well, first of all, Garden has a very nice environment, very, very easy to do certain skips. But on top of that, this part of the encounter where you know they're picking up the spits through the field, the adds don't matter. So the Cyclops, the overloads, they don't matter at all. And there's nothing you can do during the field section to speed it up as long as you don't wipe. So as long as Olsen, Radium, and uh, Ice are able to pick up all of their spits, uh, they don't even need to pick them up quickly. As long as they don't wipe the encounter, the rest of this encounter is what we call time locked. So time locked just means there's nothing you can do to speed it up. And it's just kind of, it, it is how it is. So I'm going to actually go over to our friend, I believe this is Louis POV. Yep, this is Louis POV. So you see Louis, when we skip over to his POV, he's doing this nice, cool skip. He's going straight to a second encounter where he and another two of his teammates will skip and they will pull everybody who is currently in the first encounter to the second encounter and place a perma flag like i mentioned so let's go ahead and take a look at louis he's going to go ahead and die to this load zone and that's going to allow him to spawn in the default spawn of the next load zone which is right here and so we talked about load zones before and how default spawns worked in the last Switch speedrun video, but just to give you an overall review, basically what Louis is doing here is if you enter a load zone and a spawn is not set for you yet, every load zone has a default spawn location. So what Louis was doing is the second encounter load zone actually extends to that little kind of nook that Louis managed to lodge himself into where he died to forbearance. And because he didn't touch the ground for long enough for the game to set his spawn, the game's like, oh, well, I'll just give you the default spawn. And the default spawn of the second encounter load zone happens to be at the start of the jumping puzzle above the hole, like you just saw, which is why he was able to kind of teleport there. So Louis over here, he's gonna go ahead and skip all the way to the second encounter. And you'll notice one thing about where Louis is going. Louis, that's not where the flag is. Where are you going? Well, Louis is actually making his way to the statue here. And why is he making his way to the statue? Well, on top of the statue's head, you were actually not considered as being in the encounter. If you were to go into this encounter, right, um, and you were to jump up, right, right around where Louis is standing, there's actually a turn back right above where he is. So he is just at the border of where the encounter considers you being within play bounds. And because of that, if he stays up here and the encounter is loaded in, it will not start the encounter. So he is staying here for a very specific reason, and I'll mention that when I talk about second encounter, but just know that the reason they have three skippers is because of a specific strategy where two people are going to be floating on this two statue so that they don't start the encounter when all the ads and everything spawn in, and the checkpoint is it to load up second encounter, okay? So what's going on on the main encounter POV? What's going on with Radium? Let's skip past his kind of field journey. He's just going to do some movement tech here so that he can pick up his spit on time. Nothing too crazy. He's going to make his way to the end of the field. And you'll notice here that he is equipping two pieces of armor that are going to get him under power so that he can one shot himself with forbearance. And why is that? Well, let's take a look in just a second here. So he's running into this wall. The encounter has ended. He is going to hit this new load zone and boom, he dies. Well, why does he die? Well, like I mentioned, that area above the hole is part of the second encounter load zone. And if you remember what we were talking about during entrance, right? When uh, I believe Myth and Ice, they died at entrance in that cave and they got teleported to the flag when the encounter started. That is exactly what Radium and two of his teammates are doing here. They are dying in the load zone so that when the second encounter is started and that flag is placed and those goblins start sacking, their reses will get teleported to the encounter. So you'll see that in just a second here. Radium is going to be dead, and boom, that res token appears in the bottom right of his screen. His respawn timer is up, he respawns, and boom, he's in the second encounter. So as you can see, G Miners here has just placed a perma flag, and these guys are just already just in the encounter. Just like that, they skip the entire transition, they get pulled, they death warp in. This way you don't need to get joining allies, and you can be in the encounter a little bit earlier. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's talk about how second encounter is set up. Now, second encounter, there are a couple of teams running Garden of Salvation right now, each using maybe slightly tweaked strategies, slightly different strategies, but the one thing that's common between all of them is that they are spending the most, the vast majority of their time practicing second encounter. Second encounter is one of the most intricate speedrunning encounters in Destiny 2 history. There's a lot of planning that goes into this encounter. There's a lot of ad clear, a lot of setup, but let's briefly break it down for a more casual perspective. So 
At the very start of this encounter, let's think about objectives. It's always helpful to speed, think about speedrunning encounters from as like a sort of checklist, right? You're checklisting, you're thinking about a list of objectives. What do you need to do to get this encounter off the ground? Well, you need to tether to all four relays. And there's a helpful quirk that you should know about this encounter. I'm not going to get too into detail here before I get you know too technical and take too long. But basically, this encounter will check for your progress every time it subsides. And in order to subside, you need to kill all of the ads that are spawned during the deploy. So at the very start of the encounter, you, won't, you probably won't be able to see it on radium screen here, but it'll say undergrowth defenses deployed in the bottom left. And that means that at every relay where players are currently near, they're going to spawn two lanes of ads. And those ads, once they've been killed, you'll get an undergrowth defense subsided. So the team's goal right now is to tether to all four relays and then subside by killing the ads that are spawned in at the deploy. And then that will spawn in angelics on the next deploy. And as you know, if you've done this encounter before, this encounter will not progress until you've tethered all four relays and then gotten that subside so that all the angelics start to spawn. You get angelics at every single relay, one, two, three, four in a random order, and then you can start to go to middle. So basically what these players are doing is they are making sure that all four relays are tethered to before that first subside. That is what you need to keep in mind. So in order to do that, they actually have players spread out as follows, okay? So if we take a look at this encounter map, we got one, we got two, we got three, we got four. They have two players, let's call them A and B. They have two players floating on two, and both of them will then well line to three, and they're gonna tether there. And then you have two players over here, let's call them C and D. They're gonna line to four, they're gonna tether there. And then two players are also going to tether at one, let's call them E and F. And that way you get all four relays tethered to as quickly as possible. And that is the reason why you have three people skip, right? There's four relays and there's only six players. And so you would need eight players to tether all four relays instantly. So what do you do? Well, you cut out the middleman. You have two players instantly starting on two so that they can tether instantly. And then they go to three as early as possible. Once they get to three, this is always obviously going to be the last relay to be tethered to because there's two players doing both of them. They call out kill and then their teammates will kill the adds on one in order to force the subside and get angelics on the next deploy. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this encounter plays out from Radium's POV. So Radium is one of the people that is going to go to the four relay. He is going to help kill the adds here. He's going to kill that angelic instantly so that they can go ahead and tether. So they're tethering right now. G Miners is actually doing something special where he uh, he's going to shatter skate halfway to three so he can spawn in their angelic early. I'm sure if you've done this encounter before, you know that angelics will only spawn at relays at the start of the encounter if a player is near the relay. So G Miners is helping out the two warlocks that are currently sitting on two tethering. He's going to go ahead and line halfway to three so that he can spawn in their angelic nice and early for them. So when they get there, all they need to do is shoot it instead of waiting. That way, three can be a little bit faster because obviously, like I just said, three is the only relay that gets tethered by two players for the second time, if that makes sense. Not for the second time. Three is the only relay that gets tethered by two players that have already tethered to a different relay, if that makes sense. So three is always going to be slowest. G Miners is just helping speed that along. So now, Radium and G Miners, they're just going to tether to four. And now this concept is called zero subbing. Okay, this concept that I've just mentioned to you, it's called zero subbing. It's an important part of Garden of Salvation speedrunning. They have completed zero subbing, which is basically killing or sorry, tethering to all four relays before that first subside. So now on this next deploy, they're going to get angelics immediately, which means they need to haul ass, get everybody set up on their relays so that they can kill the enemies on time. So now you probably you're probably kind of familiar with the basic structure of this raid where people usually have you know a one player a two player a three player and a four player each on a different relay and then you also have two floaters right let's call them a and b so this structure is actually not deviated from in this specific strategy used in this record right so you have a player on one you have a player on two which is going to be radium you have a player on three you have a player on four and the floaters are just going to help whatever plate gets the angelics so if the two relay gets the angelics floaters a and b they'll try and make it to two they'll try to assist with the angelics and then they'll move on okay so this is going to persist for the next four rounds of this encounter so i'm not gonna you know uh, show you anything too special i mean he's just killing ads optimally with xenophage he knows that for example you know if it's uh let, let's actually skip to another sub because that one had angelics it's gonna be a little bit different but he knows that for example you know if it's um if the right ads are spawning first, he's even helping Ice out with some angelics. If the right ads are spawning first, then the left ads are going to be next, and now he's done, 
right now he's done. So the ad clear looks pretty much like that on every single relay. They're using stuff like Xeno, they're using stuff like waveframes, snipers to make sure everything dies as quickly as possible and they're aware of where the ads are going to spawn in certain patterns. So that's something that people do to speed up this encounter. Not too complicated compared to the setup, but that is pretty much that. Now, there is something special that happens towards the end of the main sub portion of this encounter, which is when the angelics are spawning on all the relays. And that is something called early mid subs. Now, if you're familiar with this raid at all, you've done it a couple times, you know that when the walls drop and you need to go to middle, you have to kill that angelic that's in the, in the top of the washing machine, and then you have to tether, and then it'll spawn in some ads. Well, players actually found out semi-recently that if you just jump over this wall early, the tether at mid is actually already open. And that means that you can fulfill that tether requirement nice and early, and as soon as the fourth sub is completed, so the fourth round is done, all the angelics are dead, all the adds are dead, and the walls drop, the adds will spawn instantly instead of having to go to mid, kill that angelic, the box is locked up, you, you know, and then you have to tether, right? So let's go ahead and actually see what the early mid sub POV looks like. So we have, of course, here, who is this? This is Olsen. Olsen is going to go ahead and switch to stasis. And you can take a look right here. He's going to line into this wall. It's going to allow him to bounce right over this barrier. And just like that, he's made it over. And if you take a look right over here, him and Myth, they are actually going to tether to this mid tether before the angelic is even spawned in, which is excellent because now you'll see in just a second on that last sub, you'll see the ads are already spawning in. The ads are already spawning in. Normally these shielded ads, you have to kill that angelic that spawns in the top of the washing machine and then you have to tether and then the ads spawn in after a short period of time. By doing this, they are spawning these ads in a little bit early, which is, you know, five, eight seconds of time save, which is pretty nice. Pretty nice, right? It makes the end of the encounter a little bit more, more complicated for certain people. They have to clear more ads, but this is not too bad. Okay, so that's early mid subs. And now you're going to notice that you have some players that are leaving on skip. And like the first encounter to the second encounters, you actually have you actually have three players leaving on skip. OK, and now this is one of the coolest moments that you're going to ever see really in Destiny 2 raid speedrunning. Uh, very, very hype. Very, very cool. When the strategy was first brought to uh, RTA legal speedrun.com speedrunning, and that is 3-3. OK, so what these players are setting up for right now is doing two raid encounters at the same time. Right now, that's probably pretty mind boggling, right? Generally, activities in Destiny are pretty linear. You don't do kind of two raid encounters, certainly at the same time, but it's possible in Garden of Salvation for a number of unique circumstances. And so I will list them out right now so that you get a better understanding of what's going on. Number one, right? The fourth encounter load zone extends very, very, very far. Okay. So the sanctified load zone, which is where the, the final boss is, it extends all the way down. In, in fact, it extends. Let, let's go ahead and take a look right over here right over here you see that loading thing on his screen he is actually in the fourth encounter load zone believe it or not even though the fourth encounter load zone is very very far away from where he is right now he is actually in that load zone so that's number one number two is that for whatever reason for whatever reason you can start sanctified and i'm sure you know this if you've you know done the garden skip to the boss before by yourself you can start the sanctified mine encounter and complete it before you complete any of the other encounters so What's what one of the players is doing right now, which is Louis, you can't see him on the screen. He is actually at the boss right now, and he is going to shoot the boss and start the encounter, which will allow these players to do the encounter as a trio while Harpy is going on. Now, normally, if you did this in an LFG and you just started Sanctified, it wouldn't actually do anything for you because you still Destiny 2. It's like a whenever every activity is like a list of objectives, right? You need to do objective one, objective two, objective three, whatever. Now, in some activities, you can do the objectives out of order, which in this one you can, right? But you still need to do all the objectives beforehand. So if you tried to do this in an LFG, you, you went to Sanctified during first encounter and you like tried to finish it or whatever, it wouldn't do much for you. But in a speedrunning context, if you start Sanctified Mind at a certain time with certain conditions of the with the people in, in second encounter at the end of second encounter, those people don't get pulled to Sanctified Mind and you can do both encounters at the same time. And so we'll see how that's going to work right now. So I'm going to explain the first half and then I'm going to explain the second half. So for the, for the Sanctified team, what they're doing right now is called a Death Warp. And you've seen the Death Warp before. I explained it at first encounter. I explained it at second encounter. And now I'm going to explain it for fourth encounter. So you'll see here, they're in the Boundless Horizon load zone, which is where Sanctified is. And you'll see in just a second, you'll see in just a second. Sorry, I got a little excited. I skipped over. Louis is going to shoot Sanctified Mind right now. He's shooting Sanctified Mind and boom, their orbs get teleported to the Sanctified Mind and they can do it as a trio. Now you might be wondering, 
well, don't the other people in the fire team get joining allies? I mean, I'm sure somebody in an LFG in Garden with you has probably gone to Sanctified and you've gotten joining allies on your screen before and it's been, you know, a whole debacle. But why aren't why aren't the rest of the team being pulled to Sanctified Mine? Well, that's a good question. Let's go ahead and let's go back to that Radium POV that I was looking at earlier to get our answer. So if we take a look right over here, Radium, he's going to be using Xenophage. I'm going to kind of, you know, whiplash you guys back to second encounter. These are called mid subs. I mean, it's basically it's basically just ad clear, right? They're just killing ads as optimally as possible. They're three people, so it's going to be a little bit slower than six man, but they're doing their best here using Radiant Xeno. They're using, you know, Succession. Sorry, not Succession. They're using Supremacy. They're using Waveframes. You know, they're trying their best here to kill the ads as quickly as possible. Got a supplicant or two leaking. And there we go. Okay. So what they're actually doing right now is the second they're about, uh, you know, one or two seconds before they think the last ad is going to die and second encounter is going to end, they call pull or they call start. And Louis is going to shoot the boss. And the reason for that is this. In Destiny 2, you can actually cancel joining allies with certain objectives. And you'll see here that the end of second encounter, there's going to be an objective update. Boom. And it cancels their joining allies. So this is very, very cool because the end, when, when the strategy was being conceived, people were basically using cheats to make sure that they didn't get joining allies to fourth encounter. Instead, there is a, there's a way that's been discovered that the end of second encounter, if you just time it just right, just right, and you tell your skipper to pull at a certain time, the, the new objective of third encounter starting and second encounter ending, it cancels the joining allies and keeps these people here so that they can do Harpy. Right? Pretty crazy stuff. Pretty cool stuff. So now all the pieces are in place. Right? You got you got all the chess pieces on the board, and we are ready to do 3-3. Three, three. So let's take a look at what's going on. They're going to trio start Harpy here by standing in very specific positions so that they can place the flag. Again, <laughs> like I mentioned, all four encounters in Garden of Salvation are permable. Like, you can place a flag that will persist throughout the entire encounter. So third encounter, you get a perma, so you can start it as quickly as possible. These people can still rally. And fourth encounter, you get a perma, so obviously the people that are death warping in, like I showed you, they can rally when they need to. So, wonderful stuff. Let's actually talk about Harpy first. Now, I talked about the concept of gating in the last Wish Speedrun Breakdown video, and it also applies to this video as well. Gating is the concept of understanding that certain things in speedrunning don't matter, and certain things in speedrunning do matter. So, always, whenever you're doing a raid, something is going to be the limiting factor that decides how fast the raid goes. Maybe in first encounter, it's your ad clear. Maybe in second encounter, it's also your ad clear. Now, when we get to this point of the raid, it's a race between who's going to finish first, Harpy or Sanctified, third encounter or fourth encounter, which one's going to finish first. And naturally, unless you were doing slow strategies, third encounter is always going to be faster. It is just naturally a, fast a faster encounter as a trio. And the reason for this is because Sanctified Mind doing portals with three people, you're always going to be limited to three portals worth of time. And those portals, even if your ad clear is really fast, they have a set duration before you can pull people, right? That, that crit's not going to reappear for a while, no matter how fast you are. And so because of that reason, Sanctified is always going to be the gate, the limiting factor. And so while I will show you Harpy and I will explain how they do Harpy on time, you're going to see that they have like 30 or 40 seconds where they're not doing anything on the Harpy POV as they wait for Sanctified to finish. But regardless, let's go ahead and take a look at how Radium and his friends do, do Harpy, Consecrated Mind, as a trio. So number one thing to know about this encounter, if you're not familiar with it, this encounter obviously is kind of shaped like a, you know, the United Kingdom flag, right? So you have eight lanes, just like this. I'm doing my best, okay? This is not gonna be perfect, but you have eight lanes, okay? The Harpy is always gonna go down a straight lane. The straight lanes are like the washing machine, for example, which is, you know, colloquially called top. Um, and the Harpy is always gonna go down a straight lane. So that, that's something you should know. But the more important thing you should know is that a Minotaur will always spawn in the diagonal lane and it will spawn where the relay is. So players call this top left, players call this top right, they call this bottom left, and they call this bottom right for obvious reasons, because if you're going to call that top, obviously that's top left. And the way this encounter works is you need 30 motes, right? Each Minotaur drops 5, 6 times 5, everybody gets 10 motes, 10, 10, 10, very straightforward. And so, however, if they want this encounter to not be time loss, right, they need to basically do all the mechanics in one spit. And I'm sure if you've done an LFG before, if your teammates are not that competent, it can be difficult to complete all of the mechanics, get all 30 modes to the relay before the boss spits twice. And so they're actually doing this as a trio. So this does require some level of coordination. And while it is not insanely difficult, it still requires some good planning, execution, and understanding of how the encounter works. So 
In order to spawn minotaurs as quickly as possible, which is the gate of this encounter for what we're just looking at an encounter perspective, you need to basically kill a minotaur and then kill one ad anywhere in the encounter, a goblin anywhere in the encounter, then another minotaur will spawn and then you want to do this non-stop. So minotaur ad, minotaur ad, minotaur ad, minotaur ad. So on top of having one person manage the boss, you have people that are looking for minotaurs and you have people that are looking for ads. So if we take a look at what Radium is doing right now, if I go ahead and escape this and replay the video, you'll see that Radium is standing in a specific spot that allows him to watch ads as well as watch minotaurs. So he's killing an ad on his teammate's call. In fact, let me go ahead and play that for you. So the first minotaur was called as bottom right. Listen here. He says dead. So that is Radium's cue that the minotaur has died and that he is free to shoot goblins to spawn in the next minotaur. So using this kind of level of communication, you call where the minotaur is, the minotaur dies, you call kill, you kill an ad, the next minotaur spawns, you call the location, and you just do this over and over and over again. And you know, you can spawn six minotaurs very, very quickly if you have a coordinated team doing this. So let's go ahead and play it. Not too crazy, you have one guy get the spit, they pick up motes at a specific time. These players also stagger who gets motes, so it's not just the first player gets minotaurs one and two, second players get three, four, third player gets five, six. They stagger who's getting the motes a little bit so that it's easier for people to get the motes on time. Because if you have to get two minotaurs back to back, for example, like top left and bottom right, that can be a, a kind of a pain, right? So let's go ahead and see Radium here. He is going to be picking up these motes. Notice he has not rallied yet. He has not rallied yet because he wants to use this special ammo from the previous encounter and conserve some of his ammo. Now he's gonna to switch to a damage loadout. He's going to rally and he's gonna make his way to the relay where Ice is waiting for him. So let's see here, I'm just gonna skip over. They're gonna dunk their moats. Consecrated is gonna be drawn to the relay. And now I'll show you this beautiful kill. You're gonna see some hunters dodging in sync. Remember, none of this I suppose really matters from a speedrunning perspective as long as they're not slow. And they're not slow in this case, but let's go ahead and take a look at their kill anyways, cause I think it's, you know, it's a treat to watch. You know, uh, just hunters dodging in sync next to each other and uh, absolutely just destroying this boss. So just remember, keep in mind here that these guys are killing the boss as a trio right now. So he knifes the eye to get radiant. Boom. Oh my goodness. Look at that. The Nighthawk damage. You have ice on the tractor. Ooh, radium almost dies there. And they're using radiant dance machines with bait and switch recon apex to just pull off this wonderful kill here. Boom. That T crash just ends it. And yeah, consistent kill guy barely makes it halfway down the lane. And so now you may notice, right? The speed run is eight minutes and 38 seconds long and they've killed Harpy at what, 7.52 or something? Yeah, so these guys are gonna be sitting here for a while. As long as you one spit Harpy, you are not in any danger of being slower than Sanctified. So these guys have, you know, less stress on their shoulders. As long as they complete the encounter in a reasonable amount of time, they're just waiting for their teammates now. And speaking of which, let's go check out what their teammates are doing. So I'm gonna go over to the Louis POV for this one because he is the skipper. So let's go ahead and skip right over here to where he ends his skip with this wonderful bounce. Look at that going all the way up here. I'm sure you guys have seen this skip route before. You know, it's you can do it even if you're not a speedrunner. So, you know, it's pretty cool. You guys can take a look at the whole route if you're interested on your own time. And uh, I'll link the run in the description if you want to see all these POVs for yourself on speedrun.com. But um, let's go ahead. So Louis here, he's waiting for his teammates call. They are going to tell him to pull as they kill the last ad and okay there we go boom so now he places a perma flag just like that and now he has his encounter loadout on so this encounter in order to make things nice and easy uh most players will not rally immediately they will just be on succession trinity and a sword that way they can kill the ads in the portals nice and quickly use their sword to get in and out of portals nice and quickly and then when they're ready to do damage when they get pulled for the final time usually that's when people decide to rally so this encounter is actually surprisingly chill compared to second encounter and first encounter. First encounter, obviously RNG hell with uh, the box being a one in three. And uh, you know, there's a little bit more involvement from the team, a little bit more pressure. Sanctified is actually because it's, it's kind of got upsides and downsides, right? The downside, like I mentioned earlier, is that it's a pretty slow encounter because even if you're fast, you're not really rewarded for it because the portals take so long to reopen no matter what. But the upside is that it's kind of relaxing because of that, right? It's pretty hard to mess up. It's pretty hard to be slower than an instant pull. So. Let's go ahead and see what they're doing here. They're gonna mark this angelic, it seems, for uh, for cenotaph ammo. Yeah, okay, cool. And um, 
Yeah, so the name of the game here is just you have one guy go into left or go into right three times in a row, and you have two guys alternate going in and out of left or right three times in a row. So not too crazy. The guy on left has a little bit of a tougher job because they have to dunk and then make it back into the portal on time. But you know, with well skating, eager edge, all the stuff we have right now, it's not that hard. It's not that deep. So let's go ahead and take a look. <clears throat> it seems like Myth might be doing the job where he goes in three times in a row. And, you know, Louis out here, he's just killing the ads. This is really chill, right? This is almost as if you were doing it in an LFG. You're just hanging out, killing the ads, you know, killing the Cyclops if you want, you know, just having a good time, right? So let's skip over this. Let's skip to where they start getting modes. So as you can see here, Trinity just makes absolute light work of the ads in here. He gets 10 and he is called pull way before the portals are even up. He switches to his damage loadout, as you can see. And uh, yeah, he's just waiting. Look how long he's waiting, right? I mean, he is, he's not even, he's not even, you know, cracking out, out of his mind, clearing the ads as quickly as possible. He's just chilling and he still makes it well on time for the pull call. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look here. He's going to go ahead and dunk his moats. Again, none of this really matters besides the final dunk. So he's just, he's really just chilling, having a good time. Nothing too crazy going on here, All right? And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's see them start to get ready for damage. So this is the final portal pull. Uh, his teammates are currently rallying on their ammo stuff. Now, this part of the speedrun, they actually have, I believe, two warlocks and one hunter at the boss. So that's why he placed his well here so he can just survive. The other guy is going to place the well on the relay for damage. And these guys are just going to get set up. So the only high pressure moment in this encounter is really going to be the kill. And the kill is, quite frankly, these days pretty easy because uh, thanks to Cataphract with Envious Bait and Switch, uh, you know, even if Galley is nerfed and, you know, you probably shouldn't use it in a three-man setting, GLs kind of trivialize this kill, especially with enhanced relay armor like these guys no doubt are stacking up. Pretty, safe, pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward kill, I would say. Not too difficult. So these guys are just going to look for that Angelic. Yep, they kill that Angelic nice and quick. He's going to go ahead and pop Heat Rises and get in that tether. So they're going to go ahead and two-man this tether uh, because number one, it's faster. It's just two people. And number two, the other guy, the third guy can sit on the relay and just instantly start doing damage. So let's go ahead. Look at this damage. Uh, I don't think you're going to find it too interesting, right? He just hits that Izzy. Myth plays that Well of Radiance and boom. Yep, that's right. It's a uh, GL, 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 GL. And you can see that objective just updated. The Harpy team just finished Harpy, right? So... Yep, that's it. That's the kill. Pretty fast for a three man, you know, it's GLs are making light work of this boss in 2024. Or you suppose this was run in 2023. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for Garden of Salvation. Harpy ended a long time ago. There's a checkpoint that needs to be hit above the flag, but you know, not that important. And uh, let's see Louis hit his drop. So he stands at a very specific place above that pyramid structure so that he doesn't get sent flying off the map. And he drops down and he does some clean sword skate. Oh, bumps into some walls. And that's it. That's it for Garden of Salvation in 8 minutes and 38 seconds. Okay, that is, you know, this this raid will no, will no doubt be taken to an even lower time. But Garden of Salvation, the strategies haven't changed that much as of late compared to when this was run, you know, a few months ago. But um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed watching. This is certainly an absolutely unique speedrun, as I'm sure you're aware by this point. I mean, doing two raid encounters at the same time, skipping a room in first encounter, you know, having people line over a wall in second encounter and go to mid early and spawn in those ads early and tethering to a tether that you normally can't tether. I mean, it's crazy stuff, right? It's pretty crazy stuff. Um, I hope you enjoyed this, right? Um, certainly one of the most unique raid speedruns out there. I'm just looking through my list. If, uh, you know, I, I missed anything that I was supposed to talk about, I don't think I did. Yeah, I, I think I talked about everything. Yeah. Okay. So I hope you enjoyed and um, leave any comments that you want to. Uh, if you have any questions about the speed run that maybe I didn't cover. And um, after this, I believe we're covering Deepstone Crypt. So get excited for that. And um, I'll see you guys around.